Welcome. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, what time is it? 11.40. Uh, this is the fifth session of a uh, lecture series, uh, seminar series that we've titled The Ambivalence of Design. Uh, my name is Brendan Carlin. The event is co-organized as a, as a series of workshops and, uh, and the seminar series uh, by myself, James Kwang Ho Chung. Uh, we're both part of Diploma 19 at the AA. Um, Jun Sung and Jae Won Yi at Yonsei University in Seoul, that, uh, and the entire series of events is funded by the British Council. Uh, we're very excited today to welcome Federico Campagna. Uh, he's an Italian philosopher and writer based in London. He's a Francis Yates Fellow at the Warburg Institute and a critical fellow at the Royal Academy of Arts. He's written three, three books and working on a fourth, uh, Prophetic Culture, Technic and Magic, The Last Night, and uh, currently working on a book on syncretism and Mediterranean cosmology, which we're really excited to, to read. Uh, he holds a PhD from the Royal Academy of Art, where he completed a thesis on the metaphysics and metaethics of gaming design, which I'm excited also to get my hands on at some point. Uh, he has an MA from Goldsmiths University, uh, and MSc and BSc from Bocconi University in Milan. Uh, and he works as the director of rights at the radical publisher Verso. Uh, and he also has a wonderful podcast titled Overmorrow's Library. Yeah. Uh, just to say a few quick things about Federico, I think um, his philosophy for me represents the most important and urgent kind of work. Um, and I think it's pivotal for architects working today. Uh, he, I would say that he sort of reaches into uh, at the deepest levels the causes of our current crises and kind of maps out the infrastructure of our trap in a downward spiral that is is really destroying uh, the earth somehow now. Um, but Federico is also always busy pointing to designing and indeed kind of constructing ways out of the trap. Um, actually, I think a few months ago, he showed me a book that he said was maybe one of the first novels uh, written. Uh, and if I remember cor correctly, a Middle Eastern philosopher had written a book that was really teaching others how to become philosophers in a, in a sense. Um, yeah. And in, in, I, I think in that, that idea captures what I think is so powerful about his books. Um, they start to teach others how they, in a sense, might become whole in themselves and become their own world builders. Um, and I think they do that not only through a kind of precise, uh, meth uh, methodical and very architectural form. Uh, they, they do this kind of works in a very precise way, in a very architectural way. Um, and I think it also doesn't hurt that he uses many architectural examples uh, to point out to us as architects, um, uh, to begin doing that directly through our own medium as well. So we're very much looking forward to the talk today, Federico, and thank you so much for coming. Yep. Thank you. Oh. Hello. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here. So today we'll talk about metaphysics and architecture, which is a strange combination, but I would like to get to this strange combination from another combination. And it's a combination between two things that are, well, one is more ethereal than metaphysics, and we'll get to what metaphysics is, by the way. Yeah? It's a branch of philosophy that deals with the structure of reality. And so and I would like to start with another combination of two things. One more ethereal than metaphysics, and one more concrete than architecture. And it's a combination between music and war. Now, you, as you know, war and music have been together for a long time. Um, noise has always played a big part in warfare. The, the war cry that scares your enemies, um, the clangor of metal against metal, you see it also in Roman warfare. We see also ancient examples, the trumpets that brought down the walls of Jericho. In ancient Greece, before a battle, especially in the Peloponnesian War, which is the war between Athens and Sparta, the Athenians would sing a, a song called Pean before the battle. When Plato tries to reconstruct his ideal city, 
is concerned about bringing into the city um, the republic which is an image of the soul certain rhythms and certain songs because they are perfect for war they bring that warlike spirit now <clears throat> war and war and sound have been together war and music have been together also in recent and contemporary time in modern times you know the sound of trumpets is used typically in cavalry charges charges to sound the charge is used to give orders a certain sound corresponds with a certain movement if you look at a film like Barry Lyndon set in the 18th century you see that the noise of um, drums is used exactly to help that particular type of warfare tight formations in a line proceeding regularly and today it's a bit different sound and mostly music and war are not together anymore there is talks of sonic warfare, which is a different thing. So waves of sound that are used to scare, but mostly to kill or disable the enemy or to destroy obstacles. But you find music only in those um, kind of unpleasant videos of American soldiers going and killing sprees in their Hummer vehicles, you know, listening to heavy metal. So this, it's no longer the kind of relationship that it was before. And the decline of this relationship started in the First World War in World War One, And that's where I would like to start looking at the relationship between sound and music, uh, sorry, music and war, because there is a, you know, there is an old intuition, which is that you can understand the essence of an instrument the moment when you see it broken. This is how Heidegger, for example, talks about how to understand the essence of a hammer, famously. You understand what it actually is the moment it no longer works. So let's look at the moment when the relationship between music and warfare breaks in World War I. And this will take us to the relationship between metaphysics and architecture. Now, World War I is maybe a misnomer because it wasn't properly a world war. It was mostly a European war with other parts of the world involved. And it really stood out at the time, 1914, 1918, because it was the bloodiest war the world had ever seen to that point. You had battles that lasted not for hours or for days, but for months. The usual casualty rate of a battle was in the hundreds of thousands. The total casualty number after four years of war was 40 million, of which 20 million dead. So the bloodiest war we had ever seen to that point. They called it the Great War. And they imagined there wouldn't be another one, of course, which there was 20 years later. What's particularly interesting about World War I, however, is not just that it was especially bloody, but it was especially senseless. It was a senseless massacre. Every war is a senseless massacre, of course, but some more than others. The First World War started for reasons that were entirely forgotten by the end of it. The, the sacrifice of 40 million people was entirely mismatched by the reason why it started. The senselessness of it also has to do with the way in which it was fought. In typical battles until that time, you had a confrontation between humans, humans and horses, humans and weapons, but it was fundamentally humans with their appendixes. In World War I, this changes. You have a confrontation between armaments, you have a confrontation between machines, huge cannons, huge explosives, gas, and the humans become the appendixes of these machines. So it starts changing the relationship and the way in which a soldier enters this war. One starts to wonder what exactly is the place of a soldier within this war. And you find this, for example, in the poetry and in the fiction and non-fiction that came out of, of World War I. <clears throat> the experience of war was particularly strange for those who underwent it. And one of the, war, the soldiers that wrote about it, maybe the clearest, was a German soldier called Ernest Junger very interesting character that went, ended up passing through um, radical conservatism all the way to anarchism in his old age and died in 1998 at 150 years old. When he, was, when he came out of World War I, he wrote a book called Storm of Steel, which gives an idea of the experience and describes the, the experience of World War I as a combination of, um, he says, lightness and horror, exhilaration and terror. And he talks about the feeling of demoniacal lightness. So it is a situation that at the same time is incredibly horrific, but also because of its absurdity, 
is comical. Now, in all this, in this war, which was the bloodiest, the most destructive the world had ever seen, in which armaments completely mismatched humans and in, and in which also the movements and the operation on the field were incomprehensible to those who were in the trenches in the same way that in a factory at the time, like a Charlie Chaplin factory, the workers would not understand what was the productive line and what they were actually making. In all this, you had thousands of bagpipe players. There were thousands of bagpipe players, the last ones, the last musicians really to be employed in a war. Most of them, actually almost all of them, coming from Canada for various historical reasons. When Scotland lost against England, many uh, Scottish people went to Canada and they started this tradition of bagpipe playing. And so they, they were called back into the trenches. About 1,000 of them died. So 1,000 of them died mostly in the Battle of Ypres, which is a battle famous because its name gave the name to a gas. Ypres. Of course, with a bagpipe, you cannot wear a mask. A thousand of them died in that battle. Now, you can imagine that in a situation in which everything is exploding, the sound of bagpipes is entirely nonsensical. Okay? In, a war that, in a war that is already extreme for its nonsensicality, you have this element of added nonsensicality. But to be more precise, it is absurd. And the word absurd has to do with music and war. And music in particular comes from the Latin absurdus, which means out of tune. Surdus, in Italian we still say sordo, to say deaf. So there was a mismatch of the tuning in a, in a way between the explosions and this weird sound of bagpipes that had nothing to do with anything. Now, <clears throat> and this absurdity, I think, is the element that we have to keep in mind to move to explore the relationship between metaphysics and architecture. Now, I would like to stress this kind of almost surreal feeling, okay? And I, I invite you to really imagine the situation. I mean, those of you who might have studied the First World War more, maybe have a clearer imagination. Those of you who don't imagine a situation in which you are in a, in a lunar landscape, everything is exploded. And everything is exploding all the time. And you have absolutely no idea what's going on. But also, you have no idea whether you're going to live or die in the next second. And all of this for reasons that are beyond your understanding and, and acceptance. And in this situation, while everything is exploding, you listen to this. And I'll play you for two minutes. This is one of the, this is one of the pieces that was played famously Highland Laddie, like all the bonnets are over the border. It was played also in the D-Day by a, by a guy. There were no drums at the time, only backpipes. So of this, you would only hear fragments. You wouldn't hear the actual music all the time. 
And of course, you, you can see that this is an absurd way to go about doing a philosophy lecture, playing bagpipes at the beginning. It's an absurd way of going about doing warfare in that kind of situation. It doesn't make any sense. Now, <clears throat> let's remain on this, on this absurdity and this nonsensicality. We said that Ernest Junger called it a demoniacal lightness, a combination of terror and uh, comedy, in a sense. Now, Junger was trying to find words, so he used all these different combinations, because in German there wasn't a particular word to term it, and also in English there isn't, this weird combination of opposites, but there is in Greek, and it's a well-known word to philosophers, because Aristotle, when describing where philosophy comes from, uses that word, it says thauma. Thauma is a word that means horror and awe, amazement and terror simultaneously to completely opposite feelings colliding. Thauma is a feeling that you can have sometimes in, uh, in an epiphanies, you know, when you have this sublime feeling. The romantics in the 19th century were talking about this sublime, amazing feeling. Aristotle wasn't talking about a sublime, amazing feeling. He was talking about an everyday feeling. And it's an everyday feeling that you have any time, whenever you want, very domestically. It's the feeling that you have when you consider reality through a particular angle, when you look at it metaphysically, which means when you look at this room and you realize the fragility and the absurdity of this situation, or the fact that you are here, or the fact that you exist in this reality. When you're confronted with that, thauma emerges, a demoniacal lightness, and this is the origin of metaphysics and of philosophy. Why is it fragile and absurd, the experience of being in, in this room? Well, it's easy to understand if we deconstruct the experience. What we are perceiving around ourselves is a fraction of what is happening, which is filtered by our senses. We are capable of sensing and perceiving only the um, only that amount which is heavily filtered by our sensorial apparatus of this fragment and everything else is left out of course so only what we can perceive with our senses of this fragment then we systematize in our brain only a fragment of it which is filtered by the way in which our cognitive apparatus is structured and that becomes a fragment of a fragment of this fragment of a fragment what we accept as reality, you know, there's many feelings that don't, they, they are not cognized and many cognitions that are not accepted as reality, is a fragment of a fragment of a fragment, which is distorted by our cultural upbringing, our ideas about reality, our preferences as well. So what you are accepting in this moment as the reality of this room, is such a minuscule fragment that its relationship with what is actually happening is minimal. The possibility that it coincides with what's happening here is mathematically none. But also in the abstract, when we try to think abstractly about things, we are capable of thinking only to the limits of our cognition. And once again, the possibility that the limits of our cognition match with the true structure of reality is infinitesimal, i.e. mathematically is none. So, what we have here is an incredibly distorted, microscopic fraction of reality that counts for us as reality, and we know it, that it is not what is there. On top of that, we are also unable to demonstrate that this microscopic fragment to which we cling on to is actually there, as in that it is happening anywhere outside of our mind. This is an old philosophical problem, impossible to resolve. It is impossible to prove the existence of external reality. We need a leap of faith. We need to believe that, it's, that this is not a dream. And we, it's an entirely uh, gratuitous leap of faith. We cannot found it on anything. Now, <clears throat> in all this situation, the only thing that we know for certain is that we are aware that we are experiencing this, that we are a point of awareness, and we are experiencing this, this of which we have no demonstrable you know, proof that it, it exists outside of our mind, that it coincides with how we perceive it, 
So we have only knowledge of our awareness because we are our awareness. And we have only knowledge of the fact that this dream, whatever its status, constantly changes, constantly disintegrates, and it seems to be geared towards death infinitely. And we suffer this. And that's it. We don't really have demonstrable experience of anything else. All the rest is a leap of faith. Now, you can see that this uh, situation of incredible fragility, impermanence, and clear movement towards disintegration and death, and an experience of suffering, leads you to a thauma, leads you to a situation in which you are amazed at the fact of being alive, you're amazed at this spectacle, you're terrified by its kind of like lightning speed towards disintegration and by the pain that brings in its course. And in fact, there have been many um, reactions to this understanding, not only in philosophy, you had it also in ancient mythology. When ancient mythology describes the origin of the world, where it comes from the world, they say that the world begins in chaos. Chaos is this incomprehensible World War I scenario in which everything explodes and is beyond your understanding. Heraclitus, the famous Greek philosopher, talks about the fact that the origin of the world is not only chaos, but it's polemos, which means war. War is the essence of the movement of things. For example, in, in one of his famous fragments, talks about how a bow, which in Greek is called bios, is the same as life, bios. So it says, bow, bios, your name is life, but your work is death. And so there is always this concatenation of opposites on this chaotic war type background. Hmm? For the ancient Greeks, being alive was a curse. When the, the satire Silenus was interrogated by King Midas, the guy who turned things in gold, about you know, the highest wisdom, he said the highest wisdom is for humans to have never been born. The second best thing is to die immediately after you're born. Hmm? <clears throat> That's why the Greeks were so wise. Um, this experience led many philosophers to try to find solutions. So for example, in, uh, in people like Plato, there is an attempt to find something stable in this, something really real. For example, mathematical numbers or ideas or something that doesn't change. And in modernity, we had many people, writers, philosophers, that have reacted to this with despair. Choran or Leopardi with cos cosmic pessimism. Or it, the French existentialists with the dread of being absolutely free in an absolutely meaningless world. So very much like a battlefield of World War I, our experience of death has this element of chaotic nonsensicality. And like those battlefields, there is in the background the sound of bagpipes, which is even more absurd and ridiculous. But that sound is also the only possibility of keeping a melodic line. And that's exactly its function. It's not to encourage you to go further, to jump over the top, or to tell you anything in terms of orders. It's just the only melodic line, the only thing that is not absurdus, that is not out of tune, paradoxically, in all this. And this is exactly the function that it has. This melodic line, this one thing that makes sense, that is ordered in chaos, the Greeks called cosmos. The Greek word cosmos means order. You find it also in cosmetics, the ones for your face, because order is beautiful. And order is beautiful because it's the only place where you can live. In chaos, you cannot live. The only inhabitable place on a battlefield was the melodic line of the bagpipes, even though distorted and ridiculous and fragmented. <clears throat> and in fact, when philosophers try to think of, about what a world is because the word cosmos, as you know, means cosmetic and so on, order and beautiful, but it means the universe. The universe itself is like a sound of bagpipes to a certain extent. Our way of making a world out of this chaos is, a, is an attempt to find a melodic line that makes sense where we can live. And when philosophers talk about worlds, they often use this metaphor. The French philosopher Félix Guattari, for example, talked about it in terms of a ritournelle, which means a refrain, a musical refrain. 
talked about how in itself reality is entirely nonsensical, but we can invent refrains, musical refrains of sense, ritornelles, like bubbles, and sing them. And those are the bubbles of sense where we can live. Hmm? A, landscape, a narrative landscape, a musical landscape where we, where we can construct a life that is meaningful. And in fact, the world, if we think about it, what we see a world, the fragment of a fragment of a fragment, heavily filtered and distorted, which we accept as reality. And we accept when we create it and we accept it in many different ways, in many different parts of the world, of, of the planet, uh, in many different ages in history, we have done that differently. A world is in fact only an hypothesis, is an attempt to tell ourselves a narrative story about how reality is structured, what kind of things exist, what kind of things don't exist, what is possible to do in reality, what is impossible, what is true, what is superstition, how we can separate entities, moments in time, spaces, how we can measure and order the perceptions that we have. This is this attempt at creating a structure and order, which as I, I want to stress this can be done in many different ways, comes out as a story, a likely story, which we take as the world, we take as reality. We tell ourselves a story that reality is made in a certain way. And that is a ritornell. And we have done it in many different ways, in many different times in history. It's a, it's a fiction. The world is a fiction, fundamentally. It's not a real thing. And it's not any more effective at taming chaos in itself, at interrupting the war as the sound of bagpipes in World War I. But we have a special power towards it that the soldiers did not have. We have a particular way of relating to this music, which we call world, that extends its power. It's believing it. If we believe it, if we take it to be real, we make this crazy melodic line that doesn't make any sense and is completely unfounded. We make it a thing. We make it a world. We accept it. We can inhabit it. We can suspend chaos temporarily. And of course, like the bagpipers, it can be shot anytime. Okay? A world can be destroyed at any moment, it can fall into chaos, and so on, thousands of times. And it has happened thousands of times. Many worlds have ended. Now, <clears throat> who are these cosmogonic bagpipers, these, ones that, these people that sing this particular story of the world? It's us, but not us generally. Every single person invents hypotheses about how the world is structured and takes them as reality. Like every single soldier can sing to himself some sort of song from back home. But there are specialized bagpipe players and they are cultural producers, so-called cultural producers. Cultural producers are the people that are specialized in this function of creating a narrative about reality that, is, that can be inhabited as a world by the people that enter it. If you think about it, any cultural product of any kind, architecture included, um, music, poetry, philosophy, narratives of, of all types, implies its own metaphysics. We will look at it in a moment, huh? looking at ancient architecture. Every, every cultural production, in the same way that it implies its own politics and implies its own social relations, its assumptions about things, implies its own story of the world technically implies its own metaphysics, implies ideas about how reality is structured, implies ideas about what's real, what's not real, what kind of entities inhabit reality, what's true, what's false, what's possible and impossible in particular, and what kind of measures we can apply to this world. Now, architects, I think sometimes have, might have the tendency to see themselves as closer to engineering than to musicians and poets. But in fact, in their cultural artifacts, i.e. spaces, okay, they do the same as every other cultural producers. They produce cultural artifacts that imply all these ideas. And every time you create a building that has even supposedly only a function, there is always implied within that your idea of that function 
what kind of entities populate reality is implied because the function serves the kind of entities populate them and the particular distribution of agency to, to them. The forces of reality that you have to deal with, the, the stakeholders, shareholders, whatever you want to call, but also the environmental factors. What are the environment? Are ghosts part of the environmental factor? In certain societies, they are. In certain worlds, they are. In others, they aren't. The way in which you include or exclude that shapes already the world. Hmm? What's possible and impossible? What is the teleology of life? What is life for? Life is a comet towards nothingness, of course. But in the story of, of the world that we create, we add, add a sense and a meaning to life. The function is connected with the implicit idea of what is the teleology of life. How time moves. What, kind of, what is the time frame of things? Think of ancient Egyptian architecture. Think of uh, kind of Costa del Sol architecture. Very different ideas of temporalities. So, <clears throat> and I, I invite you to do this exercise maybe for what you are designing as well. For buildings that you know, buildings that you've been designing yourselves, try to understand and ask yourself what are the implicit things that are included. Now, these particular ideas that you see in contemporary architecture, in especially, are interestingly homogeneous. So different moments in time tend to have different homogeneous implications, metaphysical implications to the cultural products of that time. There seems to be a consensus. That social consensus is a socially constructed world. And in this part of the world, this, I mean, physically located in London, but it's a, it's a part of the world that is massively distributed. It's a westernized modern world that you find in Seoul, as you find in London, as you find in Tokyo and in Sao Paulo, Brazil. It's that particular idea about the structure of reality, typical of this worldview, has been active for quite a while. So long that we have almost forgotten that it's a fiction. We have almost forgotten that it's an hypothesis. That is not the truth. It is a useful, necessary hypothesis, like any other, but it's one hypothesis. It doesn't have anything special. Only recently we are starting to understand that it is an hypothesis and it starts to falter. If you consider, for example, the implication of the digital and the metaverse in our understanding of what is the material status of reality, we start to question what we started to what we used to believe was the natural, the natural state of things. If you look at transgender and queer sensibilities, we start to question the idea of natural identities. What we thought was not a fiction, but actually the natural way of things. Ecological thought makes us question what is the natural distribution of agency in the world? There are no longer people and animals, but human and non-human people. And this is a metaphysical questioning. But situations also in politics that make us wonder whether there is such a thing as post-truth makes us question what is the status of facts. We used to believe that it's easy to understand what the world truly is. Facts, not fictions. Yeah, but facts, do they exist? And we're starting to question that as well. So we are, a, we are in a moment in which the melodic line that we have used in, in, uh, in many parts of the world for, uh, for quite a while is starting to change, to shift, and to sink like many others have sunk before. And in this particular moment, I think it's important for cultural producers, the uh, cosmogonic bagpipers, to remain uh, aware of the function of what they are doing. Why? Well, for two main reasons. And the first is political. If we want to intervene politically, in a society, we are intervening in the range of the possible, right? Pol politics is the art of the possible, not of the impossible. Certain things are possible, certain things are impossible. The definition of what is possible and impossible depends on your definition of what is the world. Of course, we, what we have witnessed in the last few decades is that the definition of what is possible or impossible was so rigid that for many things, there is no alternative. And it truly isn't. There isn't any alternative because it is implicit in that metaphysical idea that that is the range and certain proposals are superstitions, they're absurd. 
to modify the range of the possible, to modify the range of the possible politics, we have to modify the metaphysical architecture that sustains it. Hmm? So at the basis of radical political interventions, it's necessary to have radical metaphysical interventions. And the second reason why cultural producers, I think, should remain aware of the importance of their, of their importance of their work in terms of modifying world structures, it has to do with the way in which world structures are propagated. So I was saying, like, he was using the metaphors of the bagpipe, but that's a misleading metaphor. Somebody plays, everybody hears. But how does it work in the world? So I come up with an idea, the world is structured this way. How do I broadcast it? How does it happen that ideas about reality change over time? How do they change? Political structures change in some ways, economic factors, revolutions, but metaphysical structures, they tend to change when they are inscribed in cultural productions. Not when cultural productions write a manifesto. Let me, let me tell you about my idea of reality, believe it or else. But when they are implied, you produce cultural products, artifacts, that imply a certain different idea of reality, that come already from that reality, that are constructed as if already the world was understood in a different way. Hmm? Think of the passage between, um, in Europe, theocratic medieval mentalities based on God's plan, and scientific modern mentalities, you know, based on a different idea of the orders of nature. Most of the scientists profess themselves as Christians, but in their cultural work, they assumed already a position that was beyond the idea of Christianity. So in cultural productions, you already imply a different world, and through that, you propagate it, because people in, uh, inhabit cultural works, especially spaces, especially architectural spaces. Now, <clears throat> the question, of course, is um, how do we do it? How do we imply things within? Now, if, if this was a seminar to writers, maybe we could discuss it in a particular way. To musicians, there would be different examples. Um, but as architects, how do you think about inscribing a different worldview within a building? It's useful to look at examples, I think, and in particular to look at examples from a completely different world. So forms of architecture that come from communities or individuals and groups of people that inhabited entirely different melodic lines, that invented entirely different refrains about what reality is and included them within their architecture. And they did it, by the way, in a much more conscious way than we do today with our cultural productions. So they seem to be more uh, specifically geared towards expressing this belief. Hmm? These architects are known as um, ancient or archaic or traditional architects. All these three words are pretty vague, of course, and they can mean different things if applied to different parts of the world. However, there is a continuity or a, or a very close similarity between forms of uh, ancient, archaic, traditional architecture in different parts of the world. Hmm? This, is, this is an important work done by anthropologists, for example, in observing the similarities and the continuities. What was their way of including their story of the world inside their, inside their spaces? First of all, they didn't include it in the way that you represent things. They didn't use the buildings or the spaces that they designed to represent their idea about reality, to broadcast it. They used it, they used it as reproductions. Basically, what they did is that they thought there is a certain structure of reality, there is a certain melodic line, and they made their building sing it itself. They turned the building itself into the player. So this is the way in which, for example, you understand a ritual. A ritual is not a homage to a certain sacred event. The, the ritual is a reproduction of a sacred event. Like a sacrifice is not an offering to the god. The sacrifice is a reproduction of the activity through which the gods keep the world spinning. This is very important, in, for example, in, in Hindu theories of sacrifice. That is through your sacrifice that you help the gods. 
to keep the world spinning because it is an active art. So this is how we should look at examples from ancient architecture and metaphysics. Let's have a look at a few examples. The way in which cities, for example, were structured. And here, of course, there is a, um, there's a, the classic text by Rick Wert, the idea of a town, which looks specifically at this aspect. The urbanism of a city is oriented with the movement of the stars and of the universe. The, the astronomical observation suggested that the, 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 the certain movement is what keeps the world spinning. That movement provides the measures which we adopt in order to make sense of the world. We count days according to the sun and the moon. And this gives us a livable time frame. We count the passage of the seasons and the, the passage of the constellations. In the work of Giorgio de Santillana, for example, is an historian of science from MIT. This is very interestingly explored. And the cities were made to fit that movement of the stars, structured in that particular way, to reproduce it, to give this feedback loop. The city was also sometimes built in the shape of the Garden of Eden, four rivers crossing, especially in the Semitic areas, so in the Middle East. The idea is a, almost a post-structuralist idea. If you create constraints, that are typical of the Garden of Eden, you then socially modify the behaviors that happen within. Now, in the same way that if you create certain buildings, you modify the behaviors. So replicating the shape of the Garden of Eden, of paradise, was uh, one part of the plan. Um, Roman encampments also included that form. In other societies, for example, in Mali, among the Dogon of Mali, the, the shape of the town is the shape of a human body. Because the idea is a, almost a hermetic idea. It's almost the idea that what is above is what is below, and what is in the small is what is in the big, and that there is a correspondence between everything. And so shaping the town itself in the shape of a human body entered a certain narration, which saw the human figure as the measure of all things, almost, which is a sentence we usually associate with the Greeks, but actually we find in the in Dogon mentality in Mali. We see the same in... Uh, funerary architecture. First of all, the very idea of a tomb is not an obvious idea. It's not obvious that you have to create, I mean, maybe for hygienic reason, you want to put some, somebody away, but the idea that you create a tomb implies, once again, implies a particular metaphysical understanding of how reality is structured. Time is that thing which does not end at death, but seeps into eternity or into an ulterior time the visible is not what exhausts reality, but the invisible continues it. A person is simultaneously alive on different levels and you have to cater for their movement beyond the visible life into the invisible life. Hmm? And different types of tombs, you see, activate different forms of metaphysics. For example, Islamic burials are typically, you would be shrouded in a, in a, in a blanket and put naked into the ground fundamentally with nothing else. Egyptian, ancient Egyptian architecture is very different. Ancient Egyptian funerary architecture creates tombs as intergalactic starships, literally, replete with inside the, the painting of the instructions of what, where you go, on which star you turn, what you do after you reach that place, and so on and so forth. And you see the space makes sense on the basis of its implicit architecture, and it communicates and it activates a certain idea of the world. In Egyptian temples, also uh, funerary temples, there is also one architectural element that I think is very good at understanding how architectural items communicate, imply, and reinforce metaphysical beliefs. When you enter a, a funerary temple, an Egyptian, ancient Egyptian funerary temple, there is the door, obviously, and then on the side, there is a thing called in German Scheintür. It's called Scheintür um, because many of the archaeologists that were discovering those uh, remains uh, in the 19th and 20th century were German. Scheintür means false door. The false door at the beginning they thought is a false door to trick the thieves, but actually the false door is very small. And it was later understood in the descriptions that it's a door that allows the spirits to pass in and out of the building. And you see that architectural item implies the idea that nature, reality is populated by kinds of entities 
which are very different from the kinds of entities that we do today. I doubt that in the buildings that you're building at the moment, you are providing ways of passage for immaterial beings, okay? But it is by providing ways of access to immaterial beings that suddenly the world becomes populated by material beings. It is literally as simple as that. Now, of course, we, we can discuss how you want to modify world ideas on the basis of what we, there is infinite possible worldviews possible available. Huh? You, the problem is choosing. <clears throat> if you think of the idea of a temple, very similar. The idea of the temple, the idea of the altar, the idea of the altar is something that we find also still in the house. You know, a table is the, the prototypical table is an altar. But the, but the temple also is not an obvious idea. You separate, you cut a section of the landscape out. It's in the word. Temple comes from the Greek temnein, which means to cut. So the temple is that space that you cut. You cut out. And this communicates and implies the idea that reality is made of separate dimensions. That there is a there is not just one field today we believe there is only one field of reality obviously yeah? that's why newspapers are almost like history books and everything you know they cover the totality of facts but in an ancient mentality there is not only facts there is facts sacred events happening simultaneously and they are incommensurable with each other this idea that there are multiple dimensions that act, they are constantly active in reality at the same time and they are not commensurable, is symbolized, for example, by the cross. You have a vertical line and an horizontal line, meaning the horizontal line of facts and the vertical line of events that don't count as facts, divine events. So the, the idea of the temple already implies this, but there is more. A temple is not some random space built in some random way. A temple has very precise proportions. Especially in ancient Greek temples, this is visible. Ancient Greek temples are known for their very specific proportions, and they have to do with the fact that they replicate the true proportions of reality. True proportions of reality. So they replicate the idea that reality is a thing that is a melodic line that is on a certain tune, on a certain rhythm, on a certain harmony. And those harmonies have to be replicated in the space as to be made sound again in feedback. Hmm? This is how, for example, in ancient Greek thought, you would come with the idea of symmetry. Symmetry, which a word that we all knew, you, know, you take a form that is on two sides the same, the symmetrical. Symmetry in Greek comes from symmetron, so with the same meter. So two things are, are, have the same measure, right? Metron, however, as its root in meter. Meter means mother, okay? So two symmetric things have the same measure because they have the same meter and they have the same meter because they have the same mother. So the idea of symmetry is not just to do with shapes, a triangle, but the idea of symmetry is that the proportions of the temple are the same proportions of the movements of the star because there is not only reality is made of multiple dimensions, but there is a symmetry between them there is a, a common measure between them. This is the belief that then gives rise to astrology. How can the stars influence our behaviors? Because there is a symmetry between us. Also, it's the belief that it influences certain forms of magic by modifying ourselves and modify the events in the world. Hmm? <clears throat> um, you find a similar thing in, uh, in Eastern, forms of sacred architecture, in particular for those of you who are um, more familiar with Buddhist sacred architecture and Hindu sacred architecture, the way in which the shape of a temple represents the shape of a mandala. A mandala is a visual representation, um, let's say, of a, of a mental progression, okay? It's a visual representation of the structure of the universe, which, however, is understood fundamentally as a structure of a mental process that is developed to, to a fuller realization of your own condition within reality and the condition of reality. The temple replicates the structure of the mandala, and by moving inside the temple, you replicate, at least potentially, of course, the movement across your own stages of consciousness all the way to a fuller understanding of reality. There is, once again, a symmetry between a mental reality and a physical reality. 
different idea, but similar concept. You see this implication of um, metaphysics in architecture. If you look at the shape of certain sacred buildings in Europe and in South America, if you look at the, um, the shape of Catholic churches, typically, they have the shape of a cross. It's a massive cross. Okay? It's usually, the Catholic ones usually have one long side and one shorter side. That shape of the cross is invisible, especially when it was built in the Middle Ages or the Renaissance. It was invisible to anyone who was supposed to see that cross. What's the point? Well, there was a viewer. And it's the same viewer of the cross, which is the, the viewer of the spectacle of a liturgy. When you do a sacred representation in a church, the procession and so on, who's looking at that spectacle? I say spectacle because, for example, in Europe, theater, after the ancient Greeks and the Roman died out for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, resurfaced in the Middle Ages as sacred theater. So what we have today, Shakespeare included, comes from sacred theater performed in churches, just outside of churches. But it was a, was a theater without spectators, except one. God. It is God that looks down and sees the shape of his home in the shape of the church. It is God that looks at the liturgy and enjoys the spectacle and takes part to it. Once again, it's an idea that the entities, the shareholders, <laughs> you see, of the, the stakeholders of, of, that are participating to your architectural project are entirely different from the ones that we usually cater for today. The Nazca lines are a very similar idea. That's why I was mentioning South America. The same in domestic architecture. Domestic architecture has particular rules. For example, often it's circular in shape. These are things that you find in the work of Mircea Eliade and René Guénon, for example. Circular homes not only are you know, convenient for, I don't know, whatever ergonomic reason, but they, but they also represent, and this is an interesting aspect of how much they, they are found from the Lakota CU in, in North America to Mongolian tribes, um, to Europe, to Africa. They, rep they replicate the, sh the same shape of the horizon. The horizon is circular, the house is circular. The horizon is the limit of the world, the house is the limit of the world. There is a literal duplication. There's a literal duplication of your ideas about what is the world and your structuring of the house. More specifically, this also has to do with your ideas about not only the horizontality of the house, but the verticality of the house. If you look at a tent, as also if you look at a megaron, so the main, the central room in a Mycenaean building, you see that there is three levels. There is the circle, and the, there is the fire at the center. There is an opening at the, at the top, okay? And the fire is with a pit underneath. There is the underground, there is the, 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 the ground level, and there is the opening to the above. This is what is known in anthropology as the idea of the axis mundi. The idea that the world is, the world is, the reality is structured among multiple dimensions, the underworld, the world, and the other world, or upper world, and that it is possible to travel across them. And the house is structured, once again, as an intergalactic traveling vessel. Okay, that allows you in its own shape to perform that. And that also implies ideas about the teleology of life. What is life for? It is to enter this movement and to perform it. So to conclude, and thank you for your patience, um, I, I would like to invite you to consider when you are um, engaging with architectural work, first of all, your position as cultural producers, even though there are many aspects of your work that are technical in another way. Of course, technical comes from the Greek word for artist, by the way, not from technician. Um, re remember that when you are dealing with cultural productions, you're always implying certain cosmologies. You're always implying certain ideas of reality in the same way that you are implying, for example, political items. If you design a city that is not accessible to disabled people, you are implying politically okay, that the city is the place of fully able-bodied people. Okay? So this is clear to understand politically, right? Now it's the same metaphysically. Okay? Metaphysically, when you design a building, you imply certain ideas of reality. And this is important because by implying them within your cultural works, 
you make them possible, you make them happen. This is the only way in which we have done it. This is the way in which we, we humans modify narrations by implying them. And by implying them, you transform the field of the possible, you transform the political field. Now, <clears throat> as cultural producers also, since you, as cultural producers, so like philosophers and many others, you are responsible for creating worlds, keep in mind that you have at least an etymological affinity with poets, poets from the Greek poiein to make. But there's, there is a particular way in which all cultural producers archetypically are poets. So the poet is the basic form of all cultural production because we are poets of worlds, hmm? makers of world, cosmogonic poets. And I think really to finish as a, as a possible way to try to have a, this understand, a slightly different, more metaphysical understanding of, you, of the implications of your work, you can try with a false etymology of the word that defines your profession, architect. Architect is another Greek term, and in, uh, technically, you know, the, say the, uh, the probable etymology is the architecton, which is really awful, is the boss of the workers, okay? Arche means um, power, being in charge. Tecton means the workers, fundamentally. But it's possible to have another etymology that is not too far off. It's maybe a little bit Borghesian, a bit imaginary, which is arches technites. Hmm? Arche, from which architecture, means power, being in charge, the boss, but also means origin. In philosophy, the very first Greek philosophers were all worried with the problem of the arche. What is the arche of the world? What is the fundamental melodic line of reality? The arche. So you can understand architects as arche technites, which means artists of the origin, which basically means world builders. Thank you for your patience. Thanks so much for this really amazing uh, talk. Um, I think one one point I wanted to start. I think we'll take a bunch of questions, maybe however much time you, considering how much time you have, but from the AA and Yonsei. But one one thing I was curious about is this. There is a really interesting. Um, you you mentioned this idea of creating realities that we can believe in. Um, and I think, I mean, for me, there's a, I, you use some examples in your writing, for instance, Fernando, Fernando Pessoa. Um, and I couldn't help but think also this idea of reproducing a cosmos uh, as architects do indiscriminately sometimes, which I think is part of the idea of behind the whole series to become aware of the, of the fact that we are world creators or we are world reproducers in a sense. Uh, we do reproduce a kind of a, a cosmos in a sense when we, when we work that this idea the idea of believing is a kind of dangerous one and it can also be a very dangerous one in a sense to become trapped in a sort of unconscious reproduction of a certain cosmos and not realize that we're all also always all cosmos makers we're always us as architects and the people that inhabit our anything that we might construct are all, always cosmos builders and or can be <laughs> potentially i guess are but can can somehow become aware of that fact and i thought I, I was just wondering if you have any examples of practices figures or practices um i mean one it's based on the idea that i thought in technic and magic it was really inspiring that it seemed like you were suggesting that, that fernando pessoa always maintains contact with the fact that he can make worlds and cannot believe in, in, in any one of these figures or realities that he creates, but at the same time is always producing by having a, a heteronym is producing different worlds at the same time and becoming different characters somehow. Um, I don't know. I, I just wonder if you can comment about this. I, I mean, that I felt like that example was really amazing. And I think that's somehow for our students, maybe something that we we want 
people, architects to take on, but we also hope that they can convey to, can, you know, part of the question is, can, can we as architects convey that power uh, to other people that might be inhabiting the city and, and buildings in a sense, so. Thanks, yeah, well, yeah, belief is, is, is a, um, a dangerous force, uh, also because it's an inescapable force, an inescapable relationship that we have to have with some fundamentals. Um, we are not we are not unfortunately endowed with a divine faculty of om omniscience and knowing everything. And we are unfortunately with some fundamental elements we have to believe. And we have to believe one way or another. We have to take certain things from, for granted. If you look at, for example, how many scientific discourses are established, science not being the art of belief, but the art of knowledge, at the very beginning, you need to start with some axioms. When Euclid begins the elements, says a point is a part of space with no dimension. Very weird idea, of course. Two parallel lines never meet. How do you know? <laughs> like, have you followed them infinitely? Or a line extends it? These are axioms. So there are things that you cannot demonstrate, but you have to believe, or at least you choose to believe. And on the basis of these <clears throat> elements of belief, you create structures of knowledge. So the relation between knowledge and belief is more complicated than it seems. And I think especially secular societies tend to um, delude themselves that knowledge can eradicate belief. It's not the case. In the same way that belief, God willing, doesn't eradicate knowledge, even when it tries. Now, the problem is this. What relationship do you have with the necessary aspect of belief? We know well that there is a tendency all too often to embrace belief completely, you know, to allow belief to substitute what we know to be a fiction. So what we know to be a, the decision, the, the product, the outcome of a choice into a natural condition. Okay, so what actually originates as I decide to, to take these axioms, I cannot demonstrate them, however, I choose them, and I choose them freely because they allow me to develop certain forms of knowledge, but also in society, they allow me to develop certain fields of the possible, they allow me to develop certain ways of life, but they're not real, okay? They, they're not justified by the fact of being naturally inscribed in the order of reality. The risk by sometimes with belief, which is interesting because you can you have this risk when you fundamentally embrace belief, but also when you fundamentally reject it. In either case, specularly, you have the same result, that you start mixing free fiction for nature. And, and th that becomes really dangerous. Now, I think the, the way in which it is useful to embrace belief is maybe to turn it the other way around, to think of it most, not thinking of belief only as a personal investment, you know, that I make the thing I believe, but it's more, I suspend this belief. Okay, so you begin with a precondition of disbelief, you, you, you begin with a skeptical condition, which originally, of course, has to do precisely with this. The skeptics were those at the very beginning, before Hume, many, many centuries before, who defined that nothing in reality can be asserted, because reality is unknowable. Pierrot, for example, Carneades. This, this philosophy, that's how skepticism was defined. So you, you begin by this idea of the unknowability of the, truthful of, of the truth of reality. And then on top of that, you decide to suspend this belief about certain things. In the same way that you are very well aware that when you look at a spectacle or a show or a, or a film, you know, it's, it's fiction, but you suspend this belief. Now, I think the relationship with narratives is very useful in that sense. So you are invested emotionally in the thing, while at the same time reminding yourself that this investment is your free act of volition. Is not, you're not naturally obliged you know, to believe that, for example, to believe your own identity. It is very useful to have some form of self-identification, unless you're a mystic, but very few of us are. Okay? But it's useful, it's a useful thing of having some form of identification. The moment you believe it, a disaster obviously it destroys you um so this kind of like detachment this ability to be in and out in and out of the world in a way in, a, in and out of the fictions i think is, is extremely useful um yeah yes 
Wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. I know we have limited time and there's a lot of people asking questions. Um, thank you also for bringing the lecture together. I think it's been a co great collection of speakers. Um, I'm very troubled with this because I I'm, I'm looking at Silicon Valley as a subject matter uh, and looking at the architecture. And it feels to me like we live in a world of that the only ones that acknowledge this cosmogonic power is corporations, but, but bluntly. Yeah? And architecture is this wonderful machine to uh, congeal this knowledge of a world. Um, and it gets that, you know, gets extended to us in all sorts of ways. Um, and I, yeah. And so I guess, so the question would be, um, we, we believe that architecture is a form of knowledge that reveals also these uh, ambivalences. And um, I, I'm, I'm just very curious to know your thoughts on like the schizophrenia of being in and out of <laughs> try, trying to understand this cos cosmogony by being in and out. I, I feel I, I'm a little bit there and it's really schizophrenic and taxing and um, perhaps dogma or this idea of belief is helpful. Um, I don't know if that's the question. Um, no, I think it's a really important question. And, and like, I think your observation on uh, corporations is spot on, unfortunately, as in, and it reminds me of another person uh, who, <laughs> another very unpleasant person to quote, uh, but actually by saying something pretty interestingly, uh, very similar. I think it was during the second Gulf War when George W. Bush was attacking Iraq on the basis of uh, Saddam Hussein having weapons of mass destruction. And then these weapons of mass destruction obviously were not there. And his um, advisor, Carl Rove, who was one of the, you know, the minds really behind the invasion was interviewed by a journalist asking, what is, re what is real? You know, it's not real that there are weapons of mass destruction. Why? And he replied, you know, while you are busy asking yourself what is reality, we're busy making it. Okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, that really gave a definition of how this activity of cosmogony can be taken, of course, you know, as an instrument of domination and oppression. Absolutely. It's, you know, like all things, like all instruments is, you know, it can be absolutely taken like everything else, unfortunately. That's why I think it's useful and important for us as kind of mini school cultural producers, you know, like individual tiny cultural producers to, to start disseminating other ideas, you know, in, in microscopic ways. But, you know, even the Christian churches at the very beginning, they're not very dissimilar. And uh, you know, they, they went a long way and they went all the way down bad. <laughs> but anyway, um, with, the, uh, with, the, um, with the question of being in and out, it's really complicated, of course, to be simultaneously in and out. And I think well, this is a lo much longer conversation, which has to do with, I was mentioning earlier, existentialism, which is a branch of philosophy that is exploded in its notoriety in the 20th century in France. But of course, existentialism goes all the way back, eh? Kierkegaard, but then you go back to um, the Hellenistic times, so the time of Alexander the Great. Now, existentialism is an attempt to create philosophical propositions that basically function in your life. If philosophy doesn't make you live better and doesn't fit with your tragic condition, it's useless, which I think is a very wise approach. Now, <clears throat> the, the problem there is to... The problem philosophically is that you have to consider that, yes, so you have a situation which you call the world, which is knowable, ordered, cosmic, in which you are present to a certain extent, and that's where you call your name, for example, or where you define yourself in some form. There is another aspect of reality. This is the minimum structure, okay? Then you can expand this infinitely. There's another aspect in which that doesn't apply. You can call it chaos, you can call it eternity, you can call it, um, I don't know, the Brahman or whatever else. And you're also present there. Or even though you cannot, you cannot call your name and you cannot identify. Now, the imagination of the outside can be manicured in the sense that we have a knee-jerk reaction because we are so habituated with an idea of, of a one-layer reality, which is entirely coincident with facts and names and definitions and identities, that what is beyond we call nothingness. You die, you sink, you vanish. The past disappears. 
You see what I mean? We have this idea that what is undefinable, what is outside of the cosmic, is chaos, but in a really terrifying way. It doesn't have to be. There are many discourses in philosophy, but also, of course, in theology, that kind of suggest different ways of understanding chaos. There are some kind of more uh, grotesque, of course, like chaos magic and all those kind of things, which is not what I'm proposing. I'm proposing uh, possibly maybe a more mystical understanding of the part which is outside of time, the part which is outside of names and so on and so forth, where you still are present even though you're not you, um, as not a nothingness, but a somethingness where you are at home also, where you're also at home. It's a bit of a situation when you are a migrant and you have two places that you don't belong fully to either of them. I think maybe in this room, I'm not the only one, okay? So you have this situation in which you are somehow a, a stranger to both, but this is not necessarily only a tragic condition also, but not only, also it's a condition of freedom. Um, I think there was a person that... Um, thank, thank you, first of all, for this beautiful... Uh, oh, it's weird to hear myself, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, I was thinking, so if I get a bite, like you propose as a kind of solution to this fragmentation of reality, this something that you just mentioned. But don't you think that this is precisely what the crisis of modernity is all about, that this kind of somethingness is, this somethingness slips into this anythingness, like it could be anything, you don't really believe in it, like this in and out, this, this kind of, I don't know, don't you think that what you propose as a kind of solution to fragmentation is in fact the crisis itself? That like this, 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 like everything, every belief becomes a pose that you can easily also um, put down and just change with something else. You don't dedicate your, whole, your entire life to something, to some belief, to a cosmology, but you just borrow it when it's um when you think it's useful and then just throw it away when when you're done thanks for the thanks for the comment and i think yeah it's it's um it's, it's true in part i mean the the crisis of modernity and when we i think when we are mentioned modernity i think we are referring maybe to the 20th century in particular okay with modernism in that kind of way so challenging the idea that you are a good um, mother or a good father, a good you know car social character, but then you disintegrate and you fail at all these things, and then you're a ruptured subject. And there is an old uh, famous passage in one of Hölderlin's poems that says, "Where there is power, there also grows the saving." Well, sorry, where there is danger, there also grows the saving power. So I think there is something in that which is you know that condition of the of the fractured subject is the crisis of modernity, which, however, it contains at the same time its own uh, disgrace and its own salvation. Now, in the way in which it is presented in 20th century narratives, uh, mostly European, you see that this condition of fragmentation means that you become entirely homeless. You are no longer at home in yourself, you're no longer at home in the world, and you have sunk into nothingness fundamentally. This same condition, however, is what you find, for example, in, um, for example, in late antiquity, in, uh, in, uh, especially in the area of Palestine and Israel, there were Jewish thinkers and so-called mystics. They were writing a, a particular literature called the Echalot literature. It's a literature of the journey through the palaces of heaven. And it's, it's a mystical literature that basically teaches you how to um connect with divinity you know according to jewish uh, theology and the first thing that you have to do in order to progress spiritually is to destroy your social self but you find this also in many other of course in buddhism similarly so the act of disintegrating your subjectivity losing yourself is seen in modernity as a terrifying catastrophe and it's seen as a starting point in other discourses so where there is danger, there also grows a saving power in the sense that I am suggesting here to consider a different way of looking at it. And what you really change is 
the level of identification and belonging that you feel to your own social subject, to, to your own social subjectivity, you disidentify with that. And on the other hand, the, the kind of attitude that you have towards the mm, uh, ineffability, the non-linguistic, non-social, non-measurable, uh, non-temporal part, the chaos, basically, that you don't have a phobic attitude towards it, but you have uh, a trusting attitude towards it. Now, of course, the trusting attitude sometimes is defined as hope, but hope is, of course, a misnomer. In fact, when you know, when there was St. Paul was talking about hoping against hope, because the idea of hope implies that you are still in the continuity of facts. I hope to win the lottery tomorrow. Okay, the idea of hope in this case applies to something that is beyond the world, and so of course you cannot hope. You have to hope against hope in a certain way. Um, the utilitarian approach to cosmologies. Yeah, I completely uh, yeah, claim that. There is, of course, in, in European philosophy, a certain figure for the kind of person that takes on intellectual traditions and uses them for himself, specifically in this uh, example, and then discards them. You find it in Nietzsche. It's called the last man. And the last man is this guy that goes around the big museum of the world and tries to get this hat to tomorrow, this other, today this philosophy, to tomorrow this religion, and drops them. Okay, And he sees this at the, the bottom of uh, decadence. Now, I think that is, that is a bit unfair. On, uh, uh, there is a, a, bit, a bit unfair. If it is done for... Um, I say, if it is done only for um, reasons of trend or curiosity, yeah, maybe it's, it's a bit bad taste to do that. But if it's done for existential reasons, that is precisely why we have invented philosophy. We haven't invented it for any other reason. We have invented culture only for that, to provide people not with a flag in whose name they die, not with an identity in whose name they incarcerate, but with intellectual tools that help them to live, to make sense of a nonsensical situation and to survive and to postpone suicide as much as possible. This is the only, this is the only reason for culture. What other justification is there? Now, it is absurd that today we have, on the one hand, we justify the fact that culture has to do with creating identities that create separations, that create incarcerations, exclusions, and wars. But at the same time, we are skeptical about using like this culture. So we, we are more okay with cultural belonging than with cultural appropriation. This is a long discourse, I think that we should, we should have. I, I am all in favor, of course, of using culture for what it is, it's a tool, it's not true, it's only for us. For us, in the same way that every other life form has its own culture and it's a tool for them. And there is no property in culture, thank God. Uh, yes, I think we have maybe five minutes, so. Maybe if we could put them together in one and then we say goodbye. <laughs> Uh, I'll try to be quick. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, in your book, A Technique and Magic, you describe magic as a therapeutic path of embracing an alternative reality system. So um, I do agree with the fact that there is a ther ther therapeutical element to it. Uh, what I've come across lately is that us as humans and also designers, we operate between knowledge, experience, and inspiration. And in a way, I would like to connect the fact that this idea of the inspiration is similar to the idea of magic. So if we are lucky enough to stumble upon this kind of ideology throughout our work, um, how do we come to believe it? And further, how do we manage to release it back into the world, into something uh, that is implying basically a new understanding but also a form of believing attached to it for the people that see it and do you think that the response to this is in collaborative work Brilliant question. <laughs> <laughs> okay i don't know if i think we work together and and could that um, magical uh thing that you're trying to communicate for architecture be a superior perspective can there be a superior metaphysical perspective for example one that would allow all of the other perspectives to exist in harmony
Okay. Okay. I'll I'll um I'll try to compress an answer in literally two minutes. And so apologies because it will be incomplete and lacking. Probably will miss most of the question. <laughs> um, about inspiration. Yes, inspiration is another way in which. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm looking more that way. It's okay because I think we have some people. Uh, inspiration is um is also another term that is used for certain forms of uh, understanding. So you 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 have um, okay. You can relate cognitively with things in many different forms you can cognize them by measuring them you can recognize them by classifying them you can recognize them by experiencing them okay and you can cognize them by some sort of strange leap that goes beyond uh, the elements of measurement and classification okay this understanding is this particular form of understanding, which is together with all the others, you know, in our particular sp specific, you know, uh, portfolio of how we un understand things, uh, can be called inspiration. It is also another form that is called in other traditions as that form of awareness in which the knower, the known, and knowing, the knower, the known, the subject, the object, and the process coincide. Okay. This is the typical way in which, for example, in Orthodox Christianity, it is suggested that you have to, you should have an understanding of God. You cannot have a rational understanding of it. You cannot have an understanding that implies a separation. You cannot have an understanding that implies a movement, but you have to have this three in one. So this is one particular inspiration is one particular way of looking at that. Interestingly, the word itself implies a, cosmo <laughs> a cosmology inspiration has to do with breathing mm -hmm. and so that is part of a particular mythological language that, that visualizes certain aspects of reality and makes sense of them mythologically so narratively like anything else through the figure of the movement of the breath it's interesting you can you can detect almost in anything the, the precondition the metaphysical pre-assumptions that holds that particular vision now with the fact of um communicating uh, visions of reality, I think the easiest way is simply to give them for granted. In, uh, in anarchism, which is a, you know, a political world to which I belong personally, okay, this is, the, um, this is known as prefigurative politics. Prefigurative politics means that you know, I don't have to wait until we have a, a law on gender equality to enforce gender equality in my life. You know, we don't have to have to wait to have a law that banishes slavery to reject slavery in my life. I can already now do it. Prefigurative means that you do it in advance, as if that particular world is already there. It's a very useful. It's a very useful uh, political tool, and especially if you are acting not collectively but individually. The discourse between collectivity and individuality is very important philosophically to discuss. And I think we, we have a knee jerk reaction that collective actions are always automatically more legitimate and more authentic and whatever than individual actions. In part because individual individuality has been destroyed by the 80s and the yuppies. Okay. So capitalism has literally, you know, polluted the idea of the individual. And that's a real shame. But if we look at, for example, the work of a very important I don't know how to define it. Revolutionary Christian anarchist like Simone Weil was a French philosopher of the 20th century. Albert Camus called it the, the only great spirit of our time. She really is one of the most important philosophers of the past 200 years. Okay, and she wrote very much about her distrust of collectivities because it says individuals can suffer, individuals can have empathic relations, individuals can feel responsible. Collectivities don't suffer. Collectivities have no empathic. Collectivities don't exist. Another anarchist called Max Stirner called them spooks. So they are <laughs> ghosts, you know, like uh, the Italians. You know, it's, it's a spook. It's not a thing. Now, so in that sense, I suggest that moving already prefiguratively at an individual level might be more advisable than moving uh, practically at a collective level. The two things don't, however, exclude each other. Okay? The two things don't exclude each other because every single movement has particular potentials. So the individual movement can achieve certain results that the collective cannot, but the collective movement can achieve certain results that the individual cannot. So to act simultaneously, as Simon Weil did, mystically and revolutionary, but not forgetting that the, the mystical part is, for, is individual by necessity. 
um, and the fact of, of keeping them all together in one. Yes, there is a technique, so to say, of keeping multiple uh, narrations incom incompatible between them together in one thing. Um, I, I wrote actually about, about that thing in particular in another book, and I, I call it the grotesque. The grotesque is the way in which you contain many different narrations about many different things, some to do with facts, some to do with ineffability, some to do with one type of measure, some with another, some to do with an idea of the world, some to do with an idea of the other world and whatever else. Together, the result is a very odd type of archetype, or ar artifact, which I could only call grotesque, in the sense that the grotesque is that form of figuration that you find in the Renaissance, where an image doesn't end, but continues into the next. A satyr becomes a pillar, becomes a leaf, becomes a fish, becomes a satyr, becomes a whale, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that is a particular kind of literary style, and it's also a particular style of cultural production that we might have to discuss possibly another time. <laughs> Thank you.